Hello, everyone, and welcome to the property panel. London, still London, which sounds a bit like an homage to Elton John, doesn't it, in the week that he led us in Glastow. Um, I'm very pleased to say that helping us look at the capital's property scene are four expert voices um, who can take us through a landscape of dizzying complexity. First, I have here on my left John James, who's the managing director of the London landlord Soho Estates. Then um, we have Michaela Chatel, uh, head of investor relations at Unica Capital, which is an international property investment specialist. Next, we have Ed Jackson, who's head of UK direct real estate at Pictay Group with a specialism in commercial development. And if you speak to Ed, he'll tell you about a dizzying number of deals that he's worked on. Um, and finally, over there, we have, you look like a mile away from me, Nick. We've got Nick Whitton, head of EMEA and UK research and UK residential and living research at JLL. Please welcome our panel. So with 38 minutes on the clock, let's turn to this subject, London. How is London doing? Um, you know, a year or two after COVID, which of course closed down uh, the capital and led journalists like me to call peak London and say it was all over. Thank goodness I was wrong. Um, a year or two after COVID, what's your assessment um, of London? Is it back? Nick, you're the man with the numbers, so Nick Whitton of JLL, let's start with you. What's the, what's, what's the picture for London? So, um, at risk of sounding a little bit crass following the last um, panel, um, London's doing well. Um, so, during COVID, we, we lost about 750,000 to a million people uh, from the population, and the majority of those that, that left were people who were either retreating back to perhaps the safer confines of a, of a family home, so you, typically younger people, students, things like that, or perhaps people who were from an international background who were here on a, on a form of a contract-based working or something like that, who, who again went home if they could. Fast forward to now, uh, we're back above the pre-COVID population, um, so London is bigger than it was now pre-COVID. Um, Heathrow traffic numbers are back to pre-COVID levels, and take it from someone who lives under the Heathrow flight path, I can guarantee you they are, they are back. Um, the tube is busy again, back at around about 85 to 90% um, of what it was pre-COVID. The drop-off is to do with that new flexible working approach, and people working perhaps not every day of the week back in the office, but they are back. Vacancy rates in offices are, are back at pre-COVID levels. So pretty much on, the, on all metrics, re read that way, you'd say London is back. Fantastic news. And in terms of valuations, a glimpse at, you know? Let, let's, let's talk about valuations later. Okay, all right, <laughs> okay. Let's say, don't get ahead of ourselves. Right, well look, uh, John, John James of Soho Estates. Um, your holdings are focused on an area of London that one might think bore the brunt of COVID in some ways the greatest. Um, how does London look? From your um, well, let me tell you. Let me tell you a, a, a small, a, the overview of property right now. Last Wednesday and Thursday, I was um, in Ascot. And I was drinking champagne, and, and I even managed to earn some money from a bookie. <laughs> right, very unusual to come over the one you went in with. Um, on Saturday, I'm at home, and I do the simplest and easiest of things myself. My decision. I try to move a piece of garden furniture. I then, I'm now, caught, I'm, I'm now lying on my back, I cannot move. I, I, I can't move from my sofa to the end of my living room without assistance. Now, I, I was able to have assistance, and then, I, then it, it, it wasn't improving, and so I needed to go and see a professional. I needed professional help. And I went to see my professional, and I sort of, agreed I would come to this and, and I made every effort to do so. And, and, and I now need uh, professional assistance and now I need my walking stick as an aid to recovery. Now, that's exactly where the property industry is right now. It was in Ascot last week. It has made a mistake. It is now kind of a basket case and it needs help and professional guidance to improve. 
Now, that's my general overview um, of where we are today, because I think there's a con the consequences, and I agree London is vital and, and it's vibrant, and our section of London, which is actually the west end of London, we should never take too much, um, uh, we shouldn't be complacent about it, about the West End, because there are so many, many other places that will take our laurels. They will take the, you can be trendy in Hoxton, you can be trendy in Shoreditch. You, 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 to retain the value of the West End with its unique culture, Soho definitely is that, and the theatres and the cinemas and bars and restaurants and the colourfulness of its bohemian past. But you can't take it for granted anymore. You've got to work and you've got to, you've got to be protective of, of the assets that we have. And I represent a family business started in 1958 in, the, in, 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 in a Soho that you've seen in films or maybe read in books. And there's a great nostalgia about that level of Soho. But believe me, if you were there, unless you were the man in the Rolls Royce, it was not a pleasant place to be. Um, and the development of Soho has subsequently come on tremendously since then. But if you, if you, if you, you, we have to nurture our assets, but we believe in them. That's the point. We are passionate about our assets. We are a family business. And my job is to, is, to, um, is to preserve the wealth of the founder, to pass it on to generations uh, that are here already. And um, I have children and grandchildren. So my, I've got to preserve the wealth. I have got to protect the wealth. And I have got to make sure it happens. Now, in the current summer circumstances, we're all finding ourselves in now. This is a blip, but it's a blip that could kill any one of us off. I mean, the, 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 during the COVID period, when I was lobbying Westminster City Council to save Soho via Alfresco, which we did very well, but the politicians felt that Soho, or the centre of London, which is now, you know, the, 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 the enterprise of, 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 of successes are like throwing a stone in a pond, you put, and, and it's that big, then that big, then that big, then it influences the rest of the pond. During COVID, that middle bit was a dark hole, which is called the centre of London, and no one wanted to go there. So you've never seen anything like that, as we all know, in your lives. So to get that prosperity to, re, to, 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 to grow again, uh, you, you, you can't be complacent about it. Is it back, though, essentially? It, it, it's kind of back, and I, I agree, the, no, the tourist, it's, it's back in a specific area. It isn't back generally across London. But in know? Soho? Soho, Soho, the one thing I'm very happy to say, we are 56% of our tenants in the hospitality business, which meant I was about to lose 56% of my entire tenants through COVID, yeah. obviously, unless we did something to help them. But there's one thing we are experiencing now, I'm sure we'll go into it, the change in occupation of offices, the change in occupation of, uh, of various working functions. But the one thing that's glorious is people like to talk to people, they like to eat, they like to drink, and they need to go out to do that. And as long as we can keep that alive, we'll be fine. Perfect. Okay, now, Michaela uh, Chatel, a unique capital. Come on, what's your sense of what's uh, of London, of where it is now? What exciting opportunities are you exploring? So what we've been seeing in our field, which is mainly based around central London in the commercial um, real estate space, is that, I say, re-emergence of everyone getting back into the office. Uh, we also saw this during COVID. There was a lot of bars, restaurants, members clubs, gyms, they all had to shut down. And if you walk around the streets of Mayfair or central London, you see all of those spaces being reopened with new brands, new uh, this independent um, concepts, concept stores, chains coming back in. We see a huge emergence or re-emergence of uh, private residences and sort of the long-term residential um, tenants with the services. And all of these people that want to be back in the office. And this is what we're seeing. Um, you also see the shift from Canary Wharf, for example, to go back to central London with HSBC, for example. After two decades, they're coming yeah. back to central London. And I think London is London. And central London will always attract and reattract and get people back in. Because as you said, especially now, we've seen you know, a few years where it was a black hole and it was, it was sad. And now it's, it's colorful and it's lively. And, even more so, which is very interesting to see for us, is for the last, yeah, I would say the last several years, the main investors were foreign investors. Now it's the local investors. And that means that they have faith. They have faith in the city of London and they have faith in this capital, world capital. But I think it's a beautiful story because if the locals have the faith and the belief and they're going to reinvest and invest, then it's because we're onto a stable, hopefully stable path forward. 
Brilliant. So, the local, so let's see if we can make it four balls in the room. Has, has, has the old smoke got its mojo back, Ed? Um, I, I rather like uh, John's analogy of the healthcare, and I think, um, I think taking that analogy a little bit further, I think some pockets of London are fully recovered and are black playing golf and, and tennis. Others still going through rehab, and others are, are in chronic uh, medical ailment, I would say. Well, um, Docklands? Well, that's where I was going, and actually, um, we, we, you know, Michaela just mentioned the Docklands. I think HSBC moving, you know, vacating almost a million square feet of space. That follows Clifford Chance moving back to London Wall as well. And I think if you have a, a, a grade A high quality office building, the old adage was you will be able to fill it. But I think if it's located in Canary Wharf, you'd have to be a bit more circumspect. And unless and until rents go down to almost bargain basement levels, th there'll be a lot of office stock in Canary Wharf that won't be able to be occupied. Um, I think it's lost a little bit of its luster. I understand they're trying to rebrand Canary Wharf as a life sciences center, but you know, there's the, the, the Jose Mourinho adage of you know, putting lipstick on a pig and it's still a pig, right? <laughs> I don't mean to insult anyone in Canary Wharf, obviously. A lot um, of lipstick. But um, I, I, think, um, I think there are pockets like that that will actually take a very long time to rebound. Um, it, ha it had a wonderful run, I'd say, of 20 or 30 years. And I think it's really in a, a complicated position right now. I think offices in the city, um, probably mid-level, but offices in, in the West End, Fitzrovia, Soho, Marlebone, I think you know, we're seeing record levels of rents there. We ourselves tried to find some office space. We couldn't find anything almost at any price, sort of grade A office spec within the West End. And I think that's where you've got that mixed amenity where people like to live, work, um, go out, there's the theaters and the restaurants and the bars, et cetera. And I think therefore office space that is grade A in those types of locations will continue to prosper. Than okay, ever. so you're, you're firmly a yes on this one, on London being, which is good news. I mean, let's face it, we're all, but then we weren't going to flood the room with pessimists. But Nick, come on, see if we can give you some pessimism now. How does London look vis-a-vis -vis the national picture and the international rivals, you know, New York, Singapore, Paris, etc. How are they doing relative to London? So, I mean, well, relativity to the, to the question is exactly the right way to look at this, of course. Um, so, first of all, versus the UK, if we start with that, um, the position is still one of the problem child is, is almost the other cities. We have, a, we have a slightly imbalanced economy. In fact, and it's quite at odds with most other advanced economies in that we have such a strong capital city and then most other advanced economies have, roughly speaking, a, a half as big second city, uh, both in population and economy. Now, London is a $1 trillion economy. It's the fourth largest city economy in the world after New York, Tokyo, and Los Angeles. Um, the, the next seven largest cities in the UK are not as big as, as London combined, even though they have the same number of people. They, they, they're responsible for about 18% of UK GDP versus London's 25 to 30% ebb and flow that it usually takes up but but that point you know if you go back pre-brexit back to maybe sort of the olympics london was right up there with new york at, at number one in that list so it's it has it has sort of been knocked off top perch a little bit um so it depends how you want to view this still still at the world's top table in the certainly in the top five top ten cities but you know we were using terms like the de facto world capital city not that long ago, and maybe maybe it can't quite claim that right now. But I also think these things, they do ebb and flow. So, but on the national picture, can Zoopla, for example, have said it's expecting a 5% price decrease in, you know, across UK housing in 2023. The Halifax has said it's gonna lower this year for the first time in a decade. Um, if the national picture is going down, what's your sense of the London prime or um, super prime sectors this year? Well, so Lond London hasn't actually seen particularly um, impressive house price growth since, since 2016. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's kind of been compressed. Most parts have been less than double digit growth over a period when the UK house price growth has been at 30 odd percent, um, per certainly coming out of COVID. Yeah. Um, so actually, what it didn't really have that recent rise, and we don't expect it to have the kind of like a, the fall that follows. Um, okay. The main thing that's driving the housing market generally is that 
we're not likely to actually see a house price crash because there just isn't the distress out there. Um, the 30 odd percent of households that do own a house with debt, and there's actually now many more households own, owning without debt, um, are feeling a crunch on their, on their income quite naturally, obviously, as, as we see the cost of debt having risen and mortgage costs rising sharply, but they're not rising enough to put people effectively in the position where they would give up their home. Well, so we're just going to see. We're going to see if anything. We're going to see a transactions crash rather than a values crash. All right, let's see if the MPC can change that. Um, on the topic of London, Michaela, um, you guys operate um, in Switzerland and elsewhere. What's your sense of London versus some of the other international centres? Well, I think first of all, this um, when it comes to real estate. Um, Again, I've said this before, London is London, Zurich is Zurich, Hong Kong is Hong Kong sort of thing. I mean, they're major business centers and they attire, uh, attract a very, very, I would say, high net worth, ultra high net worth um, level of society. London is very strong with its non-dumb scheme. I know this is up for elections, but this is something that really puts us in a very specific space because you have literally global wealth coming to London because of the benefits of that scheme. So you don't have that in, in countries like Switzerland. Zurich is a very stable city, Geneva as well. Um, it's very different when it comes to interest rates and inflation because they're not suffering as much as the UK is right now. But what you're looking at is, I would say, the long-term very stability, whereas us, we have so many opportunities in attracting because there are benefits from, I would say, the government that come in and play a significant role. Okay. Uh, now, John, um, I don't expect you to have a... Um my new knowledge of the global markets, like uh, the member of the numbers over there. But um, what's your sense of London versus the rivals? What do you hear? Um, well, I think London, London is always, I mean, London is a unique city and we should be very proud of it, but we need to be internationally competitive. And if we allow, I mean, there's a simple um, lobbying at the moment to try to relieve the, the government's view on, on VAT recovery, right? But, and, and, and most of us, most of the people that walk the streets think, well, what's that mean to me, right? It's not really a, a high-line topic. But it does mean quite a lot to the people who, who, who see an advantage in that because their alternative, they're, they're a highly mobile, high valuable um, resource. And they don't just go to Bond Street and buy something, but they stay in London, they, they visit London, they eat in London, they enjoy London. Uh, but if they're a highly mobile force, which they are, uh, they can go to Paris. They can go to um, New York. It, 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 we, it seems really a rather small thing, but there's two major bids in London, uh, in the central London. One is the heart of London, which I'm on the board of, and the other one is um, um, the, the, the one around Bond Street. I've forgotten its name now. But they are lobbying quite s strongly just to keep that. So you've got to keep your, uh, you've got to keep competitive, and, uh, and it, you know. The West End used to enjoy being the West End because that's the only place there was a theatre. We can't think like that anymore. Um, you know, we have to invest in London and we have to promote London and we have to make it um, uh, attractive. Thank you. Okay, Ed, um, you know, from your desk at Pictet, um, surveying the world, I mean, how, do, how does London look? I mean, we, don't, we can't be complacent. Population's increasing. There's obviously good news, bad news, but what's your relative success of London versus the international? Yeah, I think uh, a, a few different angles to that perspective. We, we invest in our real estate fund into Western European cities. Um, and London, um, if you compare it to somewhere like Germany, for example, that is a lot more diversified in terms of its GDP, top six cities. But actually, London's got the combination of the financial services that Frankfurt has, the media and tech of Berlin, the industry of Hamburg. And really, you, you combine the top four or five German cities together, and you've got London in one go, which is why if you try and sell, send a, a financial executive over to Frankfurt, they'll be very reluctant to go because it's almost like Canary Wharf without the Jubilee line to, uh, to, the, to the West End. <laughs> um, I, I think London has that real primacy versus other European cities in terms of language, culture, legal system, and up until recently, a stable political system. Um, I think... Um, the other aspect is just being in the right time zone and the right, having the right language is really helpful. I was recently on a fundraising trip to Asia and we met with a series of high net worth uh, family offices and institutional investors from Hong Kong and Singapore and they were all saying the very similar things that when they're focused on investing into real estate in Europe, it's primarily UK and actually primarily London. 
And these are the kind of investors that would buy trophy asset skyscrapers in the city or hotels or, or, or department, um, department stores as well. And I think they see London as a store of wealth and also a, a medium of stability. Um, a lot of them send their kids to boarding school in the UK or might have been at universities um, in central London as well. So they have that affiliation. They might buy flats for their kids or hold it as rental product. And I think you have this real flow. And if it's not coming from Southeast Asia, it could be the, the Far East or it might be Africa or South America. You've got capital flows going into London that is almost unmatched on an international scale. So I think that will be very, very hard to replicate anywhere else. And, and it is probably, it still has that primacy, top three city. I don't know if it's one, two or three at the moment. My own view is that 2016, before the, the, the EU referendum vote, that was peak London. And since then, we have suffered as a city um, as we've lost some very high talented blue collar workers and trade has come down and investment flows have come down and it's difficult to find waiters and, and people who can work in pubs and restaurants and yeah. things like that. So I think we have, we, we could have been even better than where we are yeah. and we have suffered as a result of the referendum, but I think we've still got that global primacy, certainly the most significant city within Europe and definitely top one, two or three within the world. Okay, well, that's, that's good news. Let's drill into some of the opportunities. We're just over halfway through. Um, where are people going to do well for themselves at the moment? Where, where should be, people be investing uh, or thinking about investing in, in London? Um, Ed, uh, let's not give you a break. We'll ask you to answer that one first and we'll turn to Michaela. Yeah. Put you first. Sure, thank you. Um, well, again, it sort of depends on your, your asset class and that way it's horses for courses. And, in some ways, it's uh, best of times, worst of times. I, I wouldn't be touching offices anywhere east of the city. I'd be very keen to look at office opportunities um, within the West End. I think, that, as I said, rents uh, over 100 pounds a square foot easily and up to maybe 200 pounds a square foot for best in, best in class rents around Berkeley Square and the likes of Mayfair. Um, for residential, we have a, a large portfolio of new built um, residential multifamily apartments within London. And some of those are in areas that you wouldn't necessarily think are aspirational places to live. But what we're discovering on the residential side is if it's new, if it's cheap enough and it's well located, it will be occupied very, very quickly. And we've got almost 100% occupancy in, in blocks of flats that we own in by City Airport, Limehouse, um, Upton Gardens, the old West Ham football stadium that's been converted, um, and in Wandsworth. And I think it's really, if it's at the right price point, for residential, you could almost build something anywhere as long as you have very good infrastructure links on or around tube stations. So anywhere zone two out to zone five, I'd be comfortable in residential. Um, and then other asset classes, industrial logistics, yeah. it's getting very, very expensive to make good money in industrial logistics. London has lost 1% of industrial land per year, 1% per year. So over the last 20 years, since 2000, we've lost almost a quarter of our industrial logistics space and that gets pushed out to the outskirts. Um, and it's therefore very short supply, very high demand as people buy more things online and they need last mile delivery. Um, so you could make very, very good money make, investing in industrial, but I think that boat has already set sail yep. almost, I'd say. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much, Nath. Michaela, let's it, talk about some opportunities. What can you add? I mean, to, Well, I think it complements to what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, what we've been seeing is, of course, as I said, we're, we're majorly centered around central, central London, is to our advantage, our opportunity, there's limited inventory. And that is the beauty of central London because it's historic, it's beautiful, and you're not going to have a skyscraper you know, right in front of the building. So for us, the opportunity has been, obviously some people are far too stretched with the interest rates, having owner, uh, being owners. So we've been able to go in, I would say relatively strong with a high negotiation power um, and then help them um, do a quick sell, so we've been very agile, but we've been able to act very fast, and then you know acquire some big, I'd say both historic and monumental buildings in the centre of London to then re-exploit as uh, commercial real estate. And as per what you were saying, it is so important for people now to have, you know, the access by public transportation. Again, just a side note, as we were saying before. London as a capital thrives really well, even though a lot of people have residential addresses far out of London. It's a unique thing to our capital compared to the big European cities is that the commute is completely taken for granted. Everyone expects to live an hour, an hour and a half away. And what we're saying is that 
they want to do the commute, but they want to get into central London. They want to feel that hype, the thrive of the city. They want to see the cafes, the restaurants, the members clubs, the hotels. The city is buzzing also as we yeah, heard and saw with Heathrow, tourism is back. Um, so for us being so focused on real estate, you know, we have properties who are which are still being refurbished and that we already have the tenants, they're fully complete because there's not enough inventory and everyone wants to you know, migrate back into the city. So there's a lot of opportunities and obviously there's a lot to be, to be acquired at the moment due to the <laughs> situation of past, yeah, I would say both COVID and the interest rates. Okay, brilliant, thank you. So does this mean, uh, John James of Soho states that if people want life, and we know there's a global shortage of chefs, that things like you know restaurants, bars. This is this is going uh, gangbusters. Is this a going? You know, this is the sector is booming for you. Um, well, well, it's true that there is a shortage of uh, there is a shortage of um, of personnel in the hospitality industry. I mean, uh, I think right now, I, I, I um, as a prod, as a as a product of the COVID uh, period, we encouraged and formed a thing called the Soho Business Alliance, and that was a basically grew out, grew out of adversity. Uh, we had 22 tenants who were in trouble. That grew to 44 tenants, and suddenly to get Alfresco in the streets, which was a, 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 you know, a vital thing to do. We, we ended up with 115 people being granted a license. The whole thing saved the area. The DNA of Soho was saved at that time, no doubt about it, because all those little businesses could not have survived. Um, a nightclub. I mean, we did. We have one or two nightclubs, and you know, our attitude was: you don't pay me till you can open your door again. I want you to be there. We will trade out of this together. Now we've luckily done that. I, I, we, our company wrote off nine million pounds in rent, on the clear understanding that if I didn't support these these businesses, they would not be there. Mm -hmm. Now you see, okay, so pursue them or, um, uh, 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 um, and be lit, 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 litigious about it. But you think, you need these people, the, the small businesses, where, the, where the, so the, the new talent arises and the landlord-tenant relationship has got to change considerably from what it used to be where, you know, you give, give the man a shell and take everything, everything gets put in, everything gets ripped out. And, and we, we've, we've, uh, in, in, we engage with our tenants a lot more than that now and put the infrastructure in, into our restaurants. And the last restaurants that we just led, you, I went to find, we went to talk to the man who owns the restaurant, we talked to the chef, we talked to the people behind it to see if they had the site that we wanted. And then we invited them into my very brand new building on Charing Cross Road, um, which uh, I, I may not be renting it for enough money, sadly, but I thought I was getting top rents there in that <laughs> building. Um, we, we, we've just built a building which is 350,000 square feet and what was the old Foyles bookshop. And that, for us, that, our, you know, all I can say, you know, where you, we, we have invested our money, family money, into a, uh, into a project, which was the biggest thing we've ever done. It, it, it was a stepping stone in our ability, in our understanding. Uh, it also became reputationally a stepping stone. It's now become financially a stepping stone because it's successful, and it could easily have not been with, with COVID. Um, and so, you know, all I can tell you is that um, I wanted my building to be cool, and I needed to be creative industry in there. And, and I have Warner Brothers, they, they class it as the European flagship post-production facility in the basement, four floors down. Uh, and, and one of the people who came along who wanted to rent the building, and I said to the director in charge, he said, I don't, well, I don't want them, they're not cool enough. Right? I need cool people in my building, I don't want them. And uh, we were <laughs> discussing it a bit more, and at one point he said to me, by the way, John, it's two floors, it's three and a half million. I said, well, okay, maybe they might be coolish. Then. We'll have <laughs> we might have them. But there wasn't any, I wasn't worried about it. Uh, and, and people came. Uh, and, and, and it was, uh, you know, a high headline rent, £110 a foot. And, and, but the, the thing about my building, of course, is that it's in the middle of Soho. It's got a, it was built in the urban regeneration cycle around Crossrail and encouraged to be built that at that time by uh, Robert Davis and John Walker, who in my view are sadly missed uh, in the vital um, um, future of London. But we built this building and the, the, we knew it was excellent. We knew we were never going to sell it, so that's why we made it so. Uh, and people came. And, and, and you might have been, you know, 
you know, you, you, you drive, I drive down the M4 and there's a plenty of office buildings down the M4 that I'm glad I don't own because they're empty. Um, brilliant. Thank you very much. And uh, come on, we've had wonderful stories and some figures. Nick, what are the figures on um, the hot spots of London, those hot sectors, please? Yeah, I'm going to try and pack a, a fair bit into an answer here. Um, obviously, it depends on what the return profiles are of your investment choice. Um, do you, are you, re, you know, requiring debt as well? Um, is it patient capital? All those kind of things to consider. But firstly, geographically, the city's been moving east since um, since the Olympics. Uh, no, no real sort of surprise there. The catalyst that that bought. But more than 50% of all population growth has been in the east, the other 50% around the other north, south, um, west. Um, we're starting to see a bit of a, the opportunity starting to return west now, and I think this is of how London works. It kind of goes, mm. goes up and down as well in, in the different parts of the capital. Completely support Ed's point, uh, you know, to use a glib real estate professional phrase, it's kind of beds, meds, sheds, and bites are the things you want to buy into. Beds being living assets, meds being life science assets sheds being logistics assets, particularly urban logistics, that last mile logistics, and bytes being data centers. The first for data in, in everything we do now is off the scale, and, that, and we need facilities to invest in there. And then if you want a bit of a, a kind of a outside opportunity, if you want to think about car parks, we're seeing quite a lot of interest in car parks. Surface car parks particularly are a terrible use of space when you think about high density environments like cities and 80% of them are surface level. Um, car usage is dropping, uh, car ownership is dropping, I should say, car usage is the same, just people are in urban environments using democratized forms of transport like public transport systems and Uber and things like that. Um, buying a car park and repurposing it with perhaps some living assets on there and some of those other things, that, that's where the wall of capital is looking. Okay, brilliant. Now, look, uh, forecasting is a mugs game, so I'll ask you all two mugs, please. Um, we've got five minutes left. I do want to get some questions. In a nutshell, what's your prediction on, on London or a bit of London that you're prepared to talk about? I'll start with you, Nick, and we'll work this way, please. Medium term, whatever. whatever. Um, yeah, I okay, so I'll probably kind of follow on from my last point. I would be looking to uh, find um, some, some car park assets <laughs> out west uh, in kind of Brentford, um, uh, kind of the areas, of the, the forgotten areas of West London that are actually starting to see a bit of a renaissance around Brentford in that instance, around football. I don't underestimate the power of the Premier League internationally, and, and there's a, a, a successful team now there, and, and international audiences are taking note. There's a lot of activity happening there and, and some good, good returns to be found. Are you prepared to say anything about the London residential market? Well, I, I'm, by the way, I should probably make a point. Everything should be residential-led. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we have a fundamental undersupply of housing in London, and that is the biggest threat to London, I should say. I've been obviously quite positive today. My biggest concern is housing and the delivery of housing. We build less than half of the homes we need, and particularly affordable housing. We don't get enough affordable housing coming through to drive that London engine room. Okay, brilliant. Ed, come on. Um. Yeah, um, and by the way, when we, when we say um, sheds and beds, when I go out on investor tours, I usually say it's Ed's sheds and beds to really encourage them to buy it from me. Um, I think I totally agree with you in terms of residential. We've seen that in our own portfolio, um, fully leased. R rental growth has been astonishing. When a flat comes back available, it's usually relet within five days, which is just sensational. So I think in terms of the asset class, I would go residential. Um, and I would actually go a little bit, not too far out, but also not central London. I think central London is too expensive in terms of land price development costs. So really you're looking at commuter suburbs. Um, and we see like in, in northwest London, for example, Hendon, Collindale, Mill Hill, even pushing out east, uh, Hackney, Limehouse, Upton Park, and, and south you could go to, to places like Clapham um, and Croydon a bit further out. So I think you're also seeing along the Elizabeth line where you get um, a real rental and valuation premium, yeah. whether you go east or west, so out to Stratford or on the way to Heathrow, sort of Hayes, Harlingdon, Hounslow. These locations, um, change of use from industrial to residential, I think you, you'd really do well to invest in those pockets. So there'll be good news there. Michaela, what's your outlook? I would say my outlook is it's a little bit different, but I would say focus on the next generation. So obviously right now everyone is still focused on millennials because this is the current generation probably sitting 
in the room as well, uh, focus on Gen Z. Gen Z has a very different need and approach. They've been locked up in COVID. They went to school via Zoom. They started their careers via Zoom. They want to be back. They want office uh, and jobs that provide them, you know, four to five day work weeks where they can be in the office, have the interaction. They want to be in the bars. They want to feel like everything that they missed out on for the last two or three years. So if you want to look f in the future and, you know, hopefully also try to forecast with some long-term investment, you know, really focus on the needs of the next generation because they're going to be the ones that fill the accounts. And so follow the, follow the Zs. Okay. Follow the Zs. Um, John, what's your... Um, 20 well, seconds on best right. well, I, we're, we're obviously I'm a very small little um, nut in the middle of a pond here, uh, so I have, my wider view isn't really important. The one thing that is different now, though, is that it, come 2024, there's, there's an all debt that has to be repaid, but, and it has to be refinanced, and the interest rates have just moved, in, 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 as we all know. So that debt's going to become a problem to a lot of people, so the property market's going to be rattled a bit. Um, Having watched Soho, the Soho market for the last several years, I have just been offered three properties in the last two weeks. Now, that is significant. That is unusual. That means that somebody is feeling a pinch might be coming. Okay. Okay, well, uh, bearish tone there. We have time for a couple of questions. Please put your hands up. And uh, lady standing up. Yes. Repeat offender, I think. Hand in the mic. Thank you. It is. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, you mentioned about Canary Wharf. Has the Elizabeth Line development actually strangely gone against them? Um, and how does that necessarily create the thinking around future transport developments such as Crossrail 2 and the Bakerloo Line extension? Okay. Um, who wants to go first on that? Yeah, I was, I was the one that insulted Canary Wharf, so maybe I'll okay. yeah. um, it, it, Well, in some ways, it improved the connectivity of Canary Wharf. And to get from Heathrow to Canary Wharf without having to change trains, is a, is a significant improvement, I would say. So actually, I think it was probably a net positive. Uh, where it might have lost is a sort of cannibalization effect as Stratford becomes more accessible or other business centers. Um, but you, you've always got clusters within parts of London, for example, King's Cross, the Argent Scheme, they're going to Brent Cross um, next as well, um, around Battersea as well, you've got Apple headquarters coming. I think there's always regeneration pockets that will move a little bit um, investment flows. So I think. I don't necessarily think Crossrail was a bad thing for Canary Wharf. I think it had negative and positive effects, but on the whole, probably net, it was positive. Um, I think the second phase of Crossrail is probably a problem for our great, great, great grandchildren to think about, given the, how quick it actually took for Crossrail 1 to come in. Thanks, thanks, Ed. Um, do you want to come in on that, Nick? Just one Dave? very quick point. I'd say um, what was missing from Canary Wharf was those living spaces. You know, if you used to go at the weekend, there was nobody there. Um, and actually all the stuff that's being built in recent times has, has been blocks of living spaces and actually the connectivity bit helps to make a, an attractive place to live. You don't necessarily have to work in Canary Wharf, you can live there and maybe work elsewhere. So it's, it's actually been a good thing. Can that, can that be the future of Docklands then? You know? I think it just creates that full live, work, play environment that's, that's important in all of the kind of the, the major areas of London. Mikhail, do you have anything you wanted to add? To? No, I would say, actually, per your point, the problem with Canary Wharf for so long has been that it's just it's a ghost time from ghost time from Friday night until Monday morning. So, obviously, getting people in there with such a big amount of inventory, it kind of gives that odd feeling. Let's put it that way. Yeah. If more traffic comes through, if there's more residential space and living space, it can definitely generate a new, I would say, wish to the to the to that part of the city. But it'll take some time. Brilliant. Jane, do you want to add on that? I, I don't really have a view on Canary Wharf. I, I tell you what I do remember. I remember the first time it was like a ghost town when they built it. Then it got, became vital. Then it became a centre for um, quite a lot of activity. And now that cycle has sadly returned again. Um, I, I, I think the infrastructure is there already. I, the, the, you're quite right about getting there on a train. I, 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 I've experienced that. I thought it was quite amazing. These things will return. I'm absolutely confident about that. And this maybe maybe not bankers. the same people in yeah. charge. Yeah, That's the few, only few proviso. In that case, thank you very much. We overrun. Um, gentlemen, ladies, please thank our panel, John James, Michaela <laughs> Chattel, Ed and Nick Whitten. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>